it really shares what, what the difference about John Paul was versus a lot of other um, ways of thinking about God. He, he had uh, these experiences and encounters that then opened up Scripture. And he, he would talk about Scripture, and sometimes he would be talking to, to seminary professors or, or, or pastors or, or different people, and, and it would affect them. They'd be like, well, how did you find that? Like, I've been reading that Scripture all the, you know, so many years. I've studied this, and I've never seen that before. And, and it comes through experience. Now, one, one of the things that's key i, I got to be careful. I, I want to say this, but I want to be careful not to ruin what I plan on teaching. Um, it, when, when you have an experience, it doesn't create doctrine. But some experiences can reveal doctrine that was there that you didn't know before. If it's the case, it will be found in Scripture and can be supported in Scripture. And if you're the only one that's ever found it, it's probably not true. The, the, we, we have so many things that we think that we've found in the last hundred years. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. When, when you start listening to the charismatic and the Pentecostal church that really kind of started with the Azusa Street just before the, the turn of the 20th century that, that we are a product of in many ways. Um, you know, this, this idea of like this, this new thing that God discovered, this new thing that God discovered, it's not new. It's been throughout church history. It, it, things come and things go, and we've lost more than we've gained as a church, as, as a whole. There, there, there's so many things that are there. And as you start studying, you'll, you'll find that all of these things are around. But th this particular teaching explains how heaven and earth interact and gives a, 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 a faith, a trust, an understanding of how the angelic operates with us even when we don't realize it. Because the, the, there's, God is always doing something. And just because we're not seeing or experiencing what it is that he's doing doesn't mean that he's not doing anything. When, when, when uh, Elijah's servant comes out of the house and sees the, the army coming to take him, he, he goes in and he's like, Elijah, this is awful. Like, we're We're dead. And Elijah walks out, he looks around, he goes, man, this is amazing. And then he prays that his servant's eyes would be open, and he sees all the angels around him, and he, oh, wow, they actually are there. They were already there, even though he hadn't seen them. And when you can develop trust in the unseen, which is faith, and you don't have to wait for an experience to say that your trust is valid, you will have a lot more confidence in the things that God wants to do. And there's a lot more available than what many of us have experienced. And actually, I want to give this to you because you've had encounters with angels. Yeah. And I think you're going to have some more. So, and, and it's your birthday. Well, that's amazing. Well, happy birthday. <laughs> it's called Interaction Between Heaven and Earth. Interaction between heaven and earth. If, the, if you only listen to one message that John Paul's ever done, that would be the one I would suggest. Um, yay. It's so much easier down here than up there. Feels more comfortable, too. Well, Jesus, we are so grateful. You... Bring us to your table. And you never, you, you never fail to satisfy. You, you, you never fail to bring something astounding, something beautiful, something life-giving. Lord, what a table that you've set so far. And how much more is available, Lord? We, we want to have hearts expectant. We, we want to hunger for more of you. Lord, Lord, I'm asking that as I talk today that you would allow your spirit to, to breathe life on words, that they would increase hunger, that they would increase faith, that they would give strength to the weary, Lord. That they would 
strengthen the shaking knees. <laughs> Lord, I'm asking for your anointing to be upon what's spoken. Would, would you let truth be revealed? But even more than revealed, Lord, would you let life come on truth, that it would be a seed implanted in our hearts that would grow up for the fruit of righteousness. And so, Lord, we declare that this time is holy, that this space, this is holy, this is consecrated. It's set apart for you and for you alone. Lord, anything that would not... Anything that would resist your purposes, Lord, just push it back. Lord, every thought that would distract, every remembrance that would pull us away, Lord, help us to stay focused on you, attentive to you. Set our eyes upon you, O oh God, because you are worthy. And Lord, as the words are spoken, let them reveal Jesus, the beauty of the God-man that gave himself for us. The beauty of what he accomplished. The beauty of the church that he is building to reveal his nature. Oh God, let worship arise as we hear about you. Amen. Amen. A couple years ago, we had Bonnie Shavda come and speak. We were, we we're doing our uh, Streams Academy, and she came for one of our uh, modules for one of the mentoring times of that. And uh, when she was speaking, I, I'm pretty sure it was the Sunday morning message, she, she started talking about the Apostles' Creed and how important it was. And it, it kind of set a seed that has been germinating for, for a period of time. And that seed has is, is continued to, to grow and over the last two years with COVID, so this was before COVID, so it was a little bit more than two years ago now. Um, but, but over the last two years with COVID going on, um, we, we've been in a place where the world has changed. Whether, whether we like it or not, whether we, we think that it should have or shouldn't have, doesn't matter, it has. Right? Things have shifted, and some things that we thought were normal are no longer available. And the way things were is no longer how they are. We, we, we're, we're, we're in a season of transition. And, you know, in charismatic churches, we, we talk about transition a lot. Um, but sometimes there's, there, we're always in some form of transition, whether it's, it's a momentary transition, whether it's a, a season. But it's rare that we come into a transition that affects the whole world. And we have had, in the last two years, a major transition that is affecting the world and, and is going to affect the world. And, and what happens in transitions are some things go away and new things come. Some things morph into something different. And, and, and in that morphing, one of, the, one of the requirements is that we figure out what's important enough to hold on to and then what we can let go of. Because if you try to hold on to the wrong thing, your fingers are going to get hurt when, they, when it gets pulled away from you, right? But if you let go of the important things, you, you can end up without a foundation and it takes you a lot longer to, to figure out how to move forward into the new season. And so when, when things begin to shift and change, you, you need to remember the essentials and let go of the other stuff. And, and, and being able to do that will make it a lot easier to, to transition and to move forward. For about a decade, I've been hearing prophetic words about how God was shifting the church and, and really shifting the church from an entertainment model into a presence model. How many have heard somebody talking about that? This is what we need to do. This is what we should do. This is what God's doing. There's, there's been a lot of, of talk about this. And one of the things that happened in this transition is God stopped the entertainment for at least, well, six weeks in Texas and, you know, what, eight weeks here and, you know, but 18 months in some places. But in reality, like, like things shifted. We were having conferences and we were having events and, 
you know, everybody running around. Now, it, it moved online, and so in some ways it increased, but, but in many ways it, it actually it, it forced a change in the church. And, and there's a number of things that are going to happen in this, but we, we need to figure out how to move forward. And, and if we're going to move forward, and specifically related to what it means to us as believers, we, we have to know the foundations. In, in this shift, some of the things that are going to be happening is new models are going to begin to arise. New ways of looking at truth and some hidden things that needed to be discovered are going to be brought to the surface. But in this impetus, this opportunity, this opening that's been given to step into the new, if we don't have foundations, the new that we step in might not be good. And so we're, we're going to see, and we're already starting to see it in, in the next few years, and it's not like this is a new thing, but it's just going to be more than normal. We're going to see a lot of new little heresies and false teachings and error cropping up, and, and people that, that actually have a heart of rebellion, not a heart of reformation, they're going to call themselves reformers and try to change things that shouldn't change. Because God has invited a change that should happen. And if we don't know what those foundations are, it's, it's going to be a problem. So this, this meditation on this word for the Apostles' Creed and how important, how essential it is, I, I realized how essential it actually is. We were given the, the Apostles' Creed was first written out in its current form in 185 A.D., this is just a couple generations after the apostles where, where they formulated, this is what the apostles told us from the mouth of Jesus. This is what it means to be believers. Now, there's been creeds in, in, in trying to deal with some of the confusion about these things. And, 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 you know, the Nicene Creed or the Chalcedonian Creed, which is a few centuries later, that, that came out of it. But, but the Apostles' Creed, we still have in almost exactly the same form as it was then. And, and almost every branch of Christianity looks back at the Apostles' Creed and says, this is what it means to be a Christian. It, it, it's been the, the standard that the church throughout the ages has looked at and said, well, this is what is heresy. This is what is error. If it contradicts something that's in the creed, that's heresy. If it... Creed doesn't talk about it at all. It might be error. It might be truth. Let's see what's, what's in the Bible. So that, that, that's one of the, the definitions, because I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what, what actually is the definition of heresy, and that, that's the best that I've come up with from, from church history. And, and so the, this definition, if you are a Christian, you believe these things. Now, you may not know all of them, that's part of discipleship, is learning them. But if you believe any of them to be wrong, you are not Christian. Letting that one settle in. If you believe any of them, the, the creed, the statements of the creed, if you believe them to be wrong, you are not Christian. So that's why we call certain Groups like Jehovah's Witnesses are a cult. They're not Christian. They have a lot of Christian language. I, I know very well. I grew up as one. They, they have a lot of Christian language. They talk about a lot of similar things, but it's wrong in some essential areas. They have areas that do not agree with the creed. Mormonism. They call themselves Christian, yet they have certain things. They do not agree with the creed. They are not Christian. The creed is based upon the definition of who God is and how he saves. Those are essential. There's a lot of non-essentials. I mean, whether we sing with words that we know or whether we sing with sounds, like somebody may say, well, that's not okay, or, or you have to do it this way, or you can't do it that way. Well, it's okay. That's your opinion, and you're, you're, you're good to have your opinion, but it's not in the creed. It has nothing to do with whether somebody is a believer or not. Right? Whether we see, do with instruments or we don't believe that instruments are allowed. 
Right? Whether we have songs and then we have teaching, or whether we just get together around a meal and we talk and we pray and we think about God and we, we exalt Him. Like all, all of that is forms. None, none of that's essential. That, that's opinion. And, you, and, and everybody has opinions and that's great. But there, there's a lot of different ways that we can encounter God. But there are some ways that you cannot encounter God. And that's the thing that we've missed. And it's one of the things that the world is pushing for. And so we have to be very clear on. The world is pushing for this idea that anything goes. That, that not only do, does somebody have a right to have their opinion, but that nobody can say that opinion is wrong. Now that's a problem. Because it comes from the idea that there's actually not truth, but there is truth. We, we have a definition of truth. What is true? True is Scripture. From there, we start understanding truth. And, and, and the creeds are the best that the church has done to understand what Scripture actually says and giving language to the things that they were facing because people kept on saying that God was something other than what he was. And so they gave language. No, this is who God is. So I'm going to read the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Right, there's essentials, and we, we, we could spend a lot of time, those of you that, that have looked on our, our, our YouTube channel, you, you can find, I actually did 17 messages going through this phrase by phrase, what, what each of these phrases mean, because they're, they're so important. I, I want to focus today on one particular phrase that I, I think actually is going to give strength and encouragement to some of you, but when I first say it, you, you may not... See it, but you'll get there by the time I finish up. John, yes. Could I um, have you do something first before you? Yes. Would you um, clarify because we have um, a heavily Catholic uh, culture here? Would you define that Catholic church? Yes. Yes, the Holy Catholic Church. I, I, I actually say that that way on purpose. My wife tried to convince me that I should change that word to universal. But I'm like, no, it was stolen from us. Yeah. I'm not going to give it up. I don't give up the rainbow. I'm not going to give up the word Catholic. This was before what we know of as the Catholic Church. Actually, they got their name from this creed. Their name was taken from this creed. And so in the Great Schism, half of it said, well, we're the Holy Catholic Church holding on to the creed. The other says, well, we're Orthodox because we actually believe what the creed says. Um, and that was the first church split. And, you know, we, we've, seen, we've seen thousands since, uh, but the, the word Catholic just means universal. It's actually more than universal, that there's a fullness of meaning there that, that is beautiful. And, and so that, that's the meaning of it. So when, when I say Holy Catholic Church, I'm not talking about the Roman Catholic Church. I'm talking about the Holy Catholic Church. Now, some of the Roman Catholic Church is part of the Catholic Church. But like every other church in the world, there are people that are not believers there, and there are people that are believers there. There's always Greek. The, the church is believers. It's not the people that gather in a building or call themselves by name. It's those that have been united with him through faith. Uh, that is the church. And the church universal doesn't have boxes that they fit in. It doesn't fall into branches. We are the church. Actually, it would be helpful. 
um, go, go to and find on the YouTube when I talked about the, the Holy Catholic Church because I talked about the definition of what that actually means. The church, all believers from the beginning of time to the end of time, together worshiping one. It's so much bigger. So that's what we mean by, by Catholic church. But I, I want to spend a little bit of time on this phrase, he will come to judge the living and the dead. This is a beautiful encouragement for us as believers. I, I was just reading in... Corinthians this morning is where, where I'm, I'm in, so I was, I was reading through there, and, and Paul talks about um, God coming as a judge. It's funny when you start looking at something, how often you see it, how often it talks about it, but he talks about how he's coming to, as a judge to judge our works, and, and it says to give commendation. I love that. It doesn't say to give condemnation, but to give commendation. The, that, that if we are, if we're living out our lives, the judgment is our exciting. That, 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 that's when we get our rewards. And I, I want to talk a little bit about rewards. Now, you, you can't really talk about rewards without realizing that there's the other side. And I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in defining because one of the, one of the things that we've had to fight, in, in, you know, I mean, we, we've had to fight it for a long time at, at different times, but it's been cast out of the church a number of times, is this idea that there is no hell. Um, whether it goes into the, the whole love wins universalism, everybody's going to end up being saved, and so that's not actually a, a need, or, or whether it goes into the, every, every path, every religion is, has its own path, and they're going to get to God. That there's this idea that we, we've come to, that we don't like the idea of judgment when we refuse to judge ourselves. But if we would judge ourselves, we would not fear judgment from others. We've been given this this astounding opportunity in in what Jesus did that we we can look at ourselves and say, wow, deserving of death, and then turn that in and, and, and receive deserving of life. And it comes from this simple trust in who God is, in what he accomplished, that his blood paid the price so that there is no need for there to be anyone that goes to hell. Will some go to hell? Yes, because they refuse to accept the price. There are going to be some. And if you look at what Scripture says, you cannot get away from the the fact that hell is a place of torture of torment, of pain, and that it is eternal. It says in the book of Revelation that the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. It is not a place of nothingness or emptiness. It's not a place of ceasing to being. It, it, it is a place that was not created for people. It was created for the devil and for his demons. And it's not a place where they're ruling. They're not, they're not ruling. They, they don't get anything there. They're not doing the torturing. They're going to be tortured there. Yeah. Like this idea that, that, that has become popular since Dante's Inferno of the demons torturing people, you know, the lost souls. It's not biblical whatsoever. They're not going to get that. I don't know what would be torment for a demon, but God does. <laughs> and I guarantee you, they're going to get it. It was not intended for people, but people can choose to go there. It's a good idea not to. It's a good idea not to. If you think that because of your goodness, because you call yourself a Christian because you, you go to church, because you're trying to do more good than what you've done bad, because you're a nice person, because of whatever that you're going to go to heaven, do not trust that. You will not make it. Your only trust is to throw yourself on His mercy that He paid a price that there's no way that you could ever pay. He is the only way to get there. 
And it's that easy and that, that simplicity it is one of the greatest offenses of Christianity. Every other religion tells you what you can do to earn salvation and Christianity says you're, you're not good enough, you can't. There's no way you can earn it. You're going to have to humble yourself and receive from someone else what you cannot do for yourself or you will never get there, period, period. So there is a reality of destruction that's coming. There is a judgment. He will return to judge the living and the dead. Those that are in Christ are still going to be judged. We'll start with Acts chapter 10, how this is core to the communication of the gospel. So this is Peter when he is sharing the gospel to the Gentiles for the very first time, starting in verse 34. It says, and so Peter opened his mouth and said, to, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. This is the gospel, that Jesus is appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. It's core to understanding who we are as believers. Jesus himself says something very similar. Let's look at John chapter 5. Starting in verse 21, it says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. This was actually a promise that was made about the, the, the Messiah. In Isaiah, when Isaiah was seeing Jesus coming, in Isaiah chapter 42... I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. He describes the Messiah this way. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. And this is key. Justice. Justice is the only reason that it makes sense to forgive. Anybody ever experienced something that was not right and the person that did it should never have done it and they were absolutely wrong and you didn't deserve it? Most of us, right? How can you forgive that? It's unjust. Because in your forgiveness, you're turning over the judgment to Jesus because you were not appointed to be the judge. He was. Now, the thing is, he may judge them like he judges you. He may judge them forgiven. You don't get the choice as to how he judges them. You just get to choose that he's better at it than you are. It, it, without that, it doesn't make any sense. How can you forgive somebody that raped you? 
How can you forgive somebody that killed your baby? I've talked to people that have had to forgive people in those circumstances. The only way you can do it is by believing that there is an ultimate justice, that he will make all the wrongs right. It's the only reason it makes sense. Our, 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 our foundation is on the fact that he is just. He will bring justice. He will not cry aloud, continuing verse 2, or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands wait for his law. You you get the idea. He's, He's about justice. This is our God. He is absolutely just, but his judgment is not going to be harsh. A bruised reed, he will not break. He will bring justice. A smoldering wick, he will not put out, but he will bring justice. It's not harsh judgment. It is righteous judgment. Jesus' resurrection from the dead was the proof that he was going to be the judge of the living and the dead. This was said in Acts chapter 17. Verses 30 and 31. The times of ignorance God overlooked... But now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the assurance that the judgment, the justice is coming. Jesus raised from the dead. He is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He he is seated in the place. And he will surely bring about judgment. So this judgment to come and God's right to judge is actually central to the gospel. If you don't have that, you, you, you lose the gospel. If there was no judgment, why does somebody have to die for sin? If somebody died for sin, it's proof that there is judgment against sin. Having a Christianity that does not believe that he died for sin is not Christianity. He didn't come to give us an example of what it looks like to be a good person. He didn't come to be a communicator of philosophy that we should try to to get to in our lives would be better. He came to die for sin because sinners need to be saved. This does some amazing things for us as Christians if we really believe this, if we can actually hold on to this. One, it's going to force humility. Christianity is the only club you have to be bad enough to get into. If you don't have problems, you're not welcome. I mean, Jesus himself said, he is, I, I came to save the sick. Those that are sick don't need any help. <laughs> he came to save sinners. Like Paul says, and I'm the worst of them all. That gives me humility. I don't have the right to look at somebody else's sin and say, well, they deserve worse. They deserve help. Because I've looked at my own sin and I said, I I deserve hell. So now I can have compassion no matter how caught up in sin someone is. Because I know what it's like to need forgiveness. It doesn't mean that I overlook it. It means I offer the promise. There's a solution. Trust Jesus. How do you know that you trusted Jesus? You change. If you have not changed since you trusted Jesus, you need to trust Jesus. 
Paul, he told the church, he goes, test yourselves to figure out if you're in the faith. You don't get to just keep on doing what you're doing and say, well, it's okay, God forgives me. That's not allowed. You're going to change. He came to save sinners. He came to judge sin and set free sinners. And I need to agree with that judgment first by judging the sin in me. Romans 2.16 says, On that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. This is why we must be saved. This is why we compel people to respond to God's judgment. But there seems to be two types of judgment that's found in Scripture. Well, let's, let's go to Revelation chapter 20 where it talks about the, this promise that we've read about. He's going to judge the living and the dead. What, what is that judgment going to look like? Revelation 20 gives us this picture. We're going to start in verse 11. John said, And then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence the earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, He was thrown into the lake of fire. See, there's books and then there's a book. There's there's a book of life. The, The book of life has a record of all of those that trust in Jesus Christ. That your name gets put in the book of life when you trust in Jesus Christ. Without trust, your name is not in the book of life. You 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 put your your, your hope on the author of life, the one who is life, that proved that he is life by raising from the dead. By identifying with him, you, you get put into this book. So the first judgment is that book gets opened. All right, your name's here. You get to move on. There's another judgment waiting for you. Oh, your name's not right here. You don't get to move on. The lake of fire is waiting for you. Uh, this, is, this is a really good reason to overcome our insecurities at sharing our faith with people. Because if their name is not written in that book, there is no hope. Period. Doesn't matter how good they are, doesn't matter how much they tried, doesn't matter what they've done, it does not matter. Name written or not name written, period. That's it. That's the only option for there. Those that do not have the name written, they go directly to the lake of fire. Those that do, that changes. They get to go to the next judgment. Revelation chapter 21. Verses 22 through 27, those that do get to go into the new Jerusalem. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is false or detestable, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. It's the only way in. Matthew 25, Jesus says something similar. Matthew chapter 25, verses, let's start in verse 31. 
I'm not going to read this whole passage because it'll, it'll take long, but 31 through 46, you, you have this, the, the sheep and the goats, right? The son of man sits on judgment and, and people get separated to sheep and, and to goats. Those that are on his right, the, the sheep, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What did that look like? Because I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me life. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the righteous are going to answer him, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger or welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers... You did it to me. So this judgment that that John talked about in Revelation chapter 20, and if you want to look back there, it's verse 15 specifically. And if anyone's name was not found written, I'm sorry, verse 12, that's the one I was looking for. 20 verse 12, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. So book of life, lake of fire, or further judgment. Further judgment, the books get opened, and what you've done in life gets judged at that point in time. This is no longer a judgment for punishment. This is a judgment to determine rewards. This is not a judgment for condemnation. This is a judgment for commendation. Commendation, to be commended. You've done well. Good job. That, that, that commendation, like there, there's going to be a reward that is given. And there are differing rewards for different people. Not everybody is going to get the same reward. Not everybody is going to have the same rank in heaven. We're we're going to have different places depending on what we've done in this life. Now, it's not based on the amount of our accomplishments. We're going to look at specifically what the Bible says it is based on. It is based upon potential, not what you've accomplished. Meaning this, one person has the potential to raise five people from the dead and they raise three people from the dead. Somebody else has the potential to raise 500 people from the dead and they raise 20 people from the dead. Who gets bigger reward? The first one because they fulfilled more of their potential. It's not about accomplishments. It's not because you didn't save as many people as Billy Graham. Did you save as many people as you were called to? It's, it's not in a comparison with what other people have done. It's only in comparison with what God called you to, knowing who you are, knowing how you are made. Did you use the grace that you were given? That, that, that's the question. Were you faithful with what you had? Not where, did you do as much as somebody else? That does not matter. That's not going to be judged. That judgment is not in comparison with any other person. This judgment is merely in comparison with your own potential. This, we, we each in our own lives, we, we, we will have to deal with some things. Sins that are not under the blood when we come to the judgment is going to reduce our rewards. It's one of the reasons it's a really good idea to repent quickly. Sins, our sins, after we've received Jesus, our sins that we do not put under the blood will reduce our reward. And actually can cause us to lose our reward. You read Hebrews chapter 10? If you go on sinning willfully after having received forgiveness, the blood having covered you and you just keep on doing it, 
that you, you, you actually, all that's left is a fearful expectation of judgment, not a commendation. But there's a whole different issue. You, th- this is controversial. There's a lot of verses to cover it, and we can have this conversation at some point in time. You can erase your name from the book of life. Don't be flippant about what you've been given. Don't presume upon the grace that God has given you. And Peter, Peter says that those that they, they just they, they go back and they live out the life that they had before they became believers. This is not talking about somebody that is walking with God and makes mistakes and falls. This is talking about somebody that denies Christ and goes back to their former way of life. Somebody that looks God in the face says, I don't care what you want, I'm going to do it my way. There is no expectation other than judgment for that person. I I, I wish I could give one, but I've read scripture too much. I can't. It's clear in scripture. Nobody can snatch you from his hand. You you can't be taken away, but you can choose to walk away. Just don't. Take that seriously. But the point of this is really about the judgment that comes for rewards. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul talks about this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. So we're always of good courage. We know that while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we're of good courage. We would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Why? Because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So we have rewards that are based on these things. We're going to receive rewards based on what we did Let's take a look at some of those possible rewards. The first one, Matthew chapter 5. Here's the things that are going to be looked at in this judgment. Matthew Matthew chapter 5 and verse 46. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Now, he's talking about how we love those, you love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you. So there's a reward if we do that. If you do that, every time you choose to love those who do not love you and pray for those that persecute you, you're actually setting up rewards that you're going to get when you get to heaven. You're you're adding something to that account so that when you get there, you, you get more. That's how you set up rewards. I mean, he said, don't don't work for the rewards that are on earth that moth and rust can get to and they just go away, that's going to fade, that's corruptible. Work for something that's incorruptible. Work work for something that's unfading. Uh, That unfading, that that impossible to lose are rewards that are in heaven. How you love people, especially the ones that are hard to love, is going to determine your rewards. How you treat people that treat you badly is going to determine your rewards. You can get extra rewards for doing it well. It's worth it. It's why it's worth it. We also get rewards for our faith. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 and 36 says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. 
So holding on to confidence, holding on to your faith, holding on to what has been promised. When, when you hear something from God and not letting go of that, you actually get a reward. There, there's a reward that's available from that. So you're going to get rewards from your faith. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, says that there's rewards for giving, for prayer, and for fasting. <coughs> it says not to do it for the rewards from, that come from people, but to do it for the rewards that come from God. So when we live lives, and we pray, and we fast, and we give to others that, that have need, I mean, it talks about alms, so that's specifically to the poor, what we're doing is if we do it for other people to see it because we want to look like we're holy, we want to look like we're righteous, we want to look like we're anointed, we don't get any reward. But if we just do it because it's the right thing to do, that doesn't mean that we make sure nobody finds out about it. It just means that's not our intent. It's just we just love because we love. We just pray because... We believe something happens because it's, it, it's, it's a movement of our devotion to God. We fast because it, it, it's, it's a movement of our devotion to God. We, we give because it's a movement of our devotion to God. When we do that, we get rewards. It, it actually carries up rewards that they get held up for us that we're going to get one day. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. We also get rewards for how we do our work, whether it is ministry or or what we often call secular. It doesn't matter what that work is, but there's rewards for how we do the jobs that we have. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 through 15, says according, um, verse 11, sorry, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. The day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on that foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So the work that we do, now Paul's specifically talking here about ministry work, but in Colossians chapter 3, he talks about our, our work. He's talking about servants, actually, slaves. He says how you do your work is going to determine your rewards. How you work for your boss is going to determine rewards in heaven. That's why he says, you don't work as if you're working for man. Work as if you're working for the Lord. You, what you're doing is for him. Colossians 3, what? It's a Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 through 25. I can't remember exactly how it says. So I'm going to pull it. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for man, knowing that you, from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. When you work, if you work for the Lord, then the Lord will give you a reward for that work. So how you, how you handle your business, your, your level of integrity, your level of faithfulness, your level of humility, your, your level of excellence, whether or not you cut corners, whether you get away with the things that you think you can get away with, all of that determines your reward. How you do your job has eternal consequences, whatever that job may be. doesn't matter if you're working at Chick-fil-A. Obviously, you're, you're not working today, so you might be here. Or, or if you're working as, you know, as a children's worker or, or whatever. It, may be. it doesn't matter whether that is ministry. It doesn't matter whether it's that. It doesn't matter if you're building houses. It doesn't matter if you're working at a bank. It doesn't matter, I mean... What, what is it? Oil fields? It, it doesn't matter. How, how you do that work determines rewards in heaven. We also get rewards for the people's lives that we have touched. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 19.
Paul says, for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus Christ? Is it not you? What, what he'd done to sow into them, he, he expected to get a crown, a reward for what he had done. How lives had been changed by what he had been called to. He says a similar thing in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. We get a crown for being faithful to what we're called to, even when it's difficult. This is found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So the crown that you get, the reward of having done it, is because you've done it and you've done it well. Not, not merely for what you accomplished, but how you accomplished it, as well as what you accomplished. He goes on in chapter 4, and verses 6 through 8, he says something similar. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, because I kept the faith, because I didn't stop, because I, I kept on going, I did what was right, I, I fulfilled what God called me to, because of that, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. 2 John chapter 1 says that we get a reward for holding on to right teaching. That word teaching is doctrine. There's been an allergy for the word doctrine in, in some areas of the church. We're like, well, we don't really need doctrine. We just need to know Jesus. Well, you get a reward if you got good doctrine. Now, nobody's going to have perfect doctrine because nobody can know God perfectly. But there's a reward for doing your best to know him as well as you can. James chapter 1, verse 12, and Matthew 5, 12 says that you're going to get a reward for enduring difficulties with patience. When things get hard, if you just keep going and you keep a good attitude in the midst of it, you'll get a reward for making it through the difficult times when it's hard. Anybody had to go through one of those? <laughs> Some of you have rewards. Some of you are still going through it and you have an opportunity now to decide that you're going to go through it in such a way as to earn a reward. And every single one of us will be given an opportunity to deal with something difficult in the future. 1 Peter 5, 1, 4 says that there's a reward for caring for and leading God's people. And then there's this one crown that not a lot of people get, but it's a beautiful one. There's a crown that's only given to martyrs. Those that shed their blood for faithfulness and give their lives to worship Him. Actually, lives. And here's the beautiful thing. When you get a crown, you get to go before the throne and you have something to throw at His feet. I want as many crowns to throw at His feet as I can have. What you're doing now is determining the level of authority that you're going to have in heaven. How you handle what you've been given right now is determined. You've got talents right now, it's determining how many cities you're going to be over. I mean, that's a metaphor, right? But it's determining how much authority. What you're doing now is determining eternity. It doesn't just wait until then. It's not like you just go through and then, you know, whatever you did in this life, it just gets erased and forgotten and you get to start fresh when you get there. Uh-uh, uh-uh. No, what you're doing right now is determining what you start there and where you're going to be at there. And it's going to be there all of eternity. The further you go now, the more you get for all of eternity. That's why it's worth it. That's why it's worth it to maintain our faithfulness, to pursue, to sacrifice to make the hard choice because there are rewards waiting for us. Now, I don't know what all of those rewards 
look like, but just having Jesus himself stand up and say, this one did well. Angels, look at him. Look at her. Man, I'm proud of him. Can you imagine what that would be like? I can't. I've, I've imagined it. I've, I've lived my life for that moment, and I plan on living the rest of it for that moment. It's why relationships are worth it. Fighting for the people around us. Not with the people around us, for the people around us. It's why righteousness is worth it. It's worth it to say no. That thing you think that you want. And don't go after it. It's worth it to sacrifice your insecurity and step out and do the thing that he's called you to do. Overcoming that fear and finding fulfillment. It's not just worth it because, oh, maybe you get to help some people. That, that's a really good thing. That's an amazing thing. But it's worth it because not only are you going to get to help some people, but each one of those people that you help are going to be a crown that you get to throw at his feet for all of eternity. Whether or not you judge justly now is going to determine whether or not you're trusted to judge then. Some of us are going to be judging the world. Some of us are going to be judging angels. I, I want to be found worthy of that. I, I, I want to have such righteous judgment in my heart right now that I can be trusted to judge nations. I don't know what that looks like. I have no idea, but I want to find out. And I don't want to find out by looking at somebody else that did well. It's worth it. When we remember that there are actual rewards, it changes how we do this thing. We're not just trying to make it through until we finally die and get home. Eternity doesn't start when you die. It starts when you say yes. That trajectory. And here's the beautiful thing. If you've messed up, you can start over. There is Grace. Maybe there's compromise in your life. Maybe you've been holding back because it's just inconvenient. Maybe you've let some of that emotional turmoil cause you to not truly forgive. Maybe you've been judging unrighteously by the words of man instead of by the standards of God. Whatever it is, you just bring it to him. Lord, I, I'm sorry. Would you put this under the blood? Let me start again. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. Like he, he, doesn't even, he doesn't even feel bad about it. He doesn't hold a grudge that he's had to forgive you. I mean, for the 9,000th time today. He, he doesn't think like that at all. Every single time we come, and say, I'm sorry, Lord, would you please forgive? He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then it says he, he, he throws it into the sea. He doesn't even think about it. It never enters his heart or mind again. Once it's under the blood, it's gone. Those will not meet us in the judgment. Just get it under the blood. And then start racking up rewards. Some of you have held back because you're afraid. You're afraid you're going to fail. You're afraid of what you're going to lose, what, it, what, it, what you'd have to sacrifice to be able to do what God's called you to do. Maybe friends, maybe security, maybe finances. I mean, it, it's, it's costly to go in the mission field. It costs something. There's a reward. It's worth it. 
If you've been afraid, now's the time to ask him for strength. God, would you give me courage? I've looked at the cost more than I have the reward. Would you forgive me? Lord, would you help me to set my heart on the reward? How many of you just heard that little religious, well, I shouldn't be doing it for a reward. I should be doing it because he's worthy. Well, it's nice, but it's just not what Jesus said. (laughs) Jesus said to work for a reward. So pretending like you don't want one or don't like one is telling him that he's not right. It's actually okay. It's actually he asks you. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that, that, that he who pleases God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. That's how you please God. You believe that he actually wants to give rewards. That's pleasing to God. It's not pleasing to God. So, well, I don't want to do, uh, you know, don't do anything good for me. That's not pleasing to God. That's a religious spirit. Some of you need to give yourself permission to hope for a reward. You've been stuck in this self-mutilation, thinking that it made you better. You've worshipped suffering. That thing is demonic, and it's got to go. Because it's killing you. It's time to come out of agreement with it. Right now. It's time to come out of agreement with it. There's grace right now. Lord, I believe that you want to give me a reward. And I choose to hope for a reward. Say it with your heart. See if it hurts. If it hurts to say it, that thing has been fighting you. That thing is, you you can come out of agreement with it. You can break its power. That thing is heavy in this region. I can feel it right now. When I started saying that, it, it's got, I got its attention. I can feel it. Lord, I believe that you want to reward me, and I choose to hope for reward. Lord, forgive me for how I've thought anything else. I come out of agreement with suffering. Suffering is not my badge of worth. I come out of agreement with being a victim. I do not identify with victim. I identify with victory. I trust you, God. I want reward. Father, I'm asking that you would just take this deep. Really deep, Lord. Every person that's here, every person that belongs to this community, and Lord, would you let this start to seep into this region? Would you let it seep into this region? We declare the word of God. We please you when we believe that you are and that you reward those who seek you. We please your heart when we believe that you are and that you reward those who seek you. Lord, help us hope for rewards. Lord, let us choose to live our lives for eternity, not just for now. Give us eyes to see from an eternal perspective. 
how is my choice today affecting 10,000 years from now? Because it is. How is my choice today affecting 10,000 years from now? Because it is. Let us live from that place, oh God. In Jesus' name.